Thank you so much. You may be seated. It's such an honor for me to be here. Um, I'm more of a builder than a blesser, although I try to bless, but I usually only go where I think there could be a, a relationship built. I'm not interested in just doing a bunch of conferences because that's more of a profession. Uh, I'll do it if God tells me to be a blesser at times, but my main goal is to build relationships with leaders and ministries. And I'm a quick study. I could download what I believe about somebody just by talking on the phone. And I have a really good witness in my spirit of your the pastor, his wife, and, and the leaders. And, uh, I believe it's a divine connection. As pastor said, we all God works all things for good. And we have to learn that the hard way in many areas of our life. Things go wrong, but yet they're really going right, but we think they're going wrong. So, and I love teaching when I'm sitting down, so you can't beat this. This is great. <laughs> This is uh, not often I get to sit down while I'm teaching. Uh, so as the pastor already said, I, I brought three books. There are 12 books on my website. You can subscribe to free articles every week. The website is just my name, Joseph Matera, M-A-T-T-E-R-A, Joseph, M-A-T-T-E-R-A.org. There are many training videos and Institute for Leadership and 12 books. I only took three books uh, because the topic I was teaching fits uh, these books, but there are six books on the kingdom. There's one book on prayer. There's uh, another book on, let me see, there's another book on leadership, part one of this, but I just took three. So this book, Poisonous Power, has to do with emotional health and functional leadership. Um, 10 questions to ask yourself before you become a leader or before you become a pastor. Uh, are you ready for breakthrough or burnout? There's signs of burnout. Um, there are many transformational articles in here. And uh, we just did a retreat in the beginning of October around this book, the network I lead. And some of them said that they want to get this in universities because it's so important to deal with emotional health, not just abilities and gifts of the spirit. Um, so it has to do with leadership standards, ethics, and all of that. And especially today in the age of scandal and toxic leadership, we need to understand these books. I, I carry that book around with me a lot and just read and I said, wow, this was inspired. <laughs> so how did I get this? Um, this is a book that uh, an institute was built around on apostolic leadership. So if you want to understand the kind of leader you have here, the kind of church you have, and the difference between apostolic churches and the typical contemporary churches, this book is your book. Uh, it also compares the contemporary apostles in, the, in the, this day and hour, how would they operate, how would they function, Con contrast them from prophets, uh, and shows the Jerusalem church model, the Antiochian church model, the difference between apostolic movements and institutes, um, and many other things that would be, there's another one, um, I never heard this taught, the difference between apostles of the church and apostles of Christ. That was a very interesting um, thing. So there is a difference, and um, that's in this book. And then what I'm teaching today based on the book that just came out October 1st, The Jesus Principles, Everywhere I'm Going, It's Selling Out. It's the only book I wrote that is for everybody, not just leaders. The previous 11 books were primarily to leaders, um, but this book is for everybody, and it was intentionally written for everybody. So that's probably why it's selling out, because everybody relates to it. Um, even if they don't consider themselves a leader in the workplace or church place. So this just has to do with how Jesus released greatness in people, how he made disciples in the context of a community. So what you're going to hear tonight is a lot of that is reflected in this book, the same philosophy. 
Okay, so Lord, we just thank you for our time together, and we pray that you would give us your wisdom and understanding while we have this time together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so what I want to talk about, you might have the notes already, is is your church event-driven or process-driven? And I don't believe this church is event-driven from what I'm hearing, but it's just a general title that I released in the body of Christ that I just felt like would be really good here. As a matter of fact, I just taught this to 60 movement leaders in Argentina that were from all over Latin America. And uh, the leader of that movement told me that I gave them a blueprint for the next 20 years by listening to this teaching. So there's, there's a lot of stuff in here. Um, and I'm not sure if we're going to be able to cover all of it. I mean, we do have a Q&A. And hopefully I'll, I'll see that time thing up there. <laughs> you know when to stop. So Lord, thank you for this. All right. So in the context of this particular teaching, what I've seen is people in the apostolic movement, and I'm assuming all of you understand what I mean when I say apostolic. So you're all familiar with the term apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, and evangelist, fivefold ministry, Ephesians 4.11, uh, which is the fastest growing movement in the global church today. It's called the apostolic movement. Whether they call it apostolic or not, it's led by visionaries, geographic locations, not necessarily denominational, and it's spreading like wildfire all over the world. It's the fastest growing expression of the church in the world. Uh, that is to say the apostolic. But uh, most people in the apostolic movement only understand the fivefold ministry individualistically. So when we say the fivefold ministry, we're referring to what Paul the Apostle describes in Ephesians 4.11. He said, God has given some to be apostles, some to be prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists. Another way we could describe that is apest, apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd, teacher, apest. Um, and God is giving apest to the body of Christ. And the reason why he gave a pest to the body of Christ, Paul says in verse 12 of Ephesians 4, for the perfecting or maturing of the saints. Someone say the maturing of the saints. The maturing of the saints. So he didn't give us apostles so that they could have their own network on TV and make a lot of money. Um, he didn't give us evangelists so that they could just have crusades all over the world. The primary reason why God gave us evangelists is to equip the church not to do the work of evangelism, but to equip the church to do evangelism. So God gave us these five gifts that are the ministry DNA of Jesus. When you look at the, uh, the Gospels, you will see Jesus works as an apostle. He works as a prophet, pastor, teacher, and evangelist. He's called the apostle. Uh, in Confession of Our Faith in Hebrews 3. He was called teacher constantly in the Gospels. Uh, he was called prophet when he raised the dead in Luke 7. They said a mighty prophet has come. He was an evangelist because he started off his ministry by quoting from Isaiah 61, where he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to preach the Gospel, to evangelize, to proclaim. That's an evangelist to evangelize, to proclaim the gospel to the poor. Uh, and then he called himself the good shepherd. He's a pastor. He says he's a good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep in John chapter 10. So the whole of fivefold ministry is given to the church. Everybody in the body of Christ has a DNA of Christ that fits one of those five not just in the church place, but the workplace. It's very important for you to understand this. So the function, not the office, of one of these five will be in every person. And only some have the grace gift to be leaders in the church, but everyone has some aspect of Jesus' ministry. Because it tells us in Ephesians 4, 7, that we've been given grace. He didn't just say some. 
considered Ephesians 4, 7, we've all been given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. So that is for the whole church. So everybody has the ministry DNA of Christ. We're called to be like Christ in character. We're called to have the love of God. We're called to have the mind of Christ by being a servant. So that's the character of Christ. But the ministry of Christ is the fivefold, the apes, apostle, prophet, pastor, and teacher, and evangelist. So everybody here has one of those or more than one of those functioning in their life, depending upon how you operate. Uh, for example, the apostle, uh, the entrepreneurs, they're the pioneers, they're the people who take risks. Jesus called 12 apostles, not 12 pastors and 12 evangelists to launch his movement because the apostles are the pioneers. They're the ones who reproduce after their own kind. They're the ones who multiply. They don't just plant churches, they plant movements. Amen. And, um, and so even in the business world, you can see a person who takes, for example, the original McDonald's was a mom and pop hamburger store. An apostle in business took that and turned it into a franchise. So apostles in the workplace are able to take something and bring systems of multiplication and they're entrepreneurs, they're risk takers who take something and make it a franchise. The prophets are those in the workplace who can predict trends. They understand, you hear them on C-SPAN or business uh, uh, news. And they're constantly analyzing the trends, telling where to invest the money, or analyzing politics, or showing what's going on in the world and what they think is going to happen in the next three years, uh, and the hot spots in the world, like in Iran or or the uh, the China Sea, or um, you know the conflict right now that's going on with uh, Russia and and the U.S. And, and all these things that are going on. So they're able to they, they have a gift to predict and to understand where the world is headed. And then uh, the teachers are those who take complexities and make it easy to understand. So if you have a car, how many have their own car with a manual on how to operate your car? Let me see your hands. Whenever you buy a new car, you have an owner's manual, right? Well, a person with the gift of teacher wrote that. And you might say, well, what if they weren't saved? Well, Jesus created all people. His DNA is in creation. It's in the created order. It's called common grace or creation grace. So people who don't know the Lord, the way they're internally wired, operate in fivefold without realizing it. Once they're born again, God takes that gift and sanctifies it and anoints it and turns their motivation around and uses it to his glory. So you can see people who don't even know the Lord that have the gift of apostle, prophet, pastor. Pastors are those who are in, uh, in psychology or psychiatry or who are nurses. They're people who care for people for a living. Uh, the evangelists are the car salesmen, the insurance salesmen. <laughs> They're the ones who are into marketing. They can sell you your own house, you know, <laughs> you, what you pay for your mortgage, and you had a letter of satisfaction from your bank 10 years ago that could get you to buy your own house. Um, they're the influences. In the church, they are the ones who have the largest churches. They have a gathering anointing, they influence, but they may not necessarily know how to have strong patterns and systems in their church, so they're the kind of people that have large churches, but have back doors as big as the front door. A lot of people coming and going, a lot of uh, staff transition, and very few people are getting discipled. So they are, a lot of the mega churches are like that. So they might be led by evangelists. And then the pastors, as I said, are, are those who have care ministry and teachers. So I think we went through all five. So you can see it in... The world, and through common grace, God has gifted every human, because the Bible says in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, that he made both male and female in his own image. So that's why everyone deserves dignity, irrespective of their lifestyle, or their ethnicity, or their skin color, or their religious affiliation. 
whether we like them or not or agree with them or not, every person is born as an imager of God. So uh, that means they were called to represent God on the earth to the animal kingdom, the plant kingdom, the birds, the fish, and the environment. And what they do with it is going to be how they're going to be judged on the judgment day. But every person deserves respect because they were made in God's image. This, this, they were supposed to be part of his council, representing him and governing the earth. Now, only those who are serving God are doing that, obviously. But we are called to respect all people, even if we vehemently disagree with their lifestyle. Uh, so we can disagree in love, but we don't castigate. Uh, we don't name call. We don't bully. We love and respect everybody. That's how the Christian way is if you really believe that we're image bearers of Christ. So the fact that we're all image bearers, because it tells us in John 1 that all things are made by Christ, and apart from him is nothing made that has been made. In him is life, and that life is the light of men, not the light of saved men, but men, meaning the understanding for arithmetic, for geopolitics, for subatomic physics, marine biology, or the law of lift, the law of gravity, that came from Jesus. In him was life, and that light was what? The light of men. By his common grace, we are able to function in civilization. When it says God so loved the world, the word world in the Greek is the word cosmos. It doesn't just mean people. It means the systems that support the people. So God loves economics. God loves politics. God loves sewer systems. God loves any kind of system that sustains the image bearers that he made. God is not just into your two-hour Sunday meeting when you're singing hymns, but when you are doing what you're graced by God, and when you're doing what God gave you to, the ability to do in the workplace, that is an act of worship, especially if you're a Christian. So if you're called to be a mathematician, while you're teaching your students, you can be filled with the Holy Ghost. It's an act of worship. You don't have to wait until you come to church and sing songs. If you're called to be an athlete, a martial artist, a singer, uh, a, uh, an architect, a plumber, whatever your gifting is, if you're doing it unto the glory of God, it's an act of worship. Because in the Old Testament, one of the primary words for work this is in my book, Understanding the Wineskin of the Kingdom. One of the primary Hebrew words for work is the word worship. Mm -hmm. Meaning worship is not just singing songs. Worship is when you use your abilities for the glory of God. Mm -hmm. So all of that was extrapolated out of Ephesians 4.11. The fivefold ministry was not just to be used in the church place but in the workplace. And, and so we have to understand that. So the church gathered on Sunday should be the church scattered on Monday. You are the church on Monday just as much as you are the church on Sunday. The church on Sunday should be primarily an equipping center, a time when you love one another, a time when you have the Lord's Supper, a time when you are encouraging each other, but on Monday, that is your missional call to represent God and what you've learned when you're together in church, whether it's a small group, whether it's Sunday or any other days you meet, you ought to bring that into the workplace. And when you do that, you are understanding your calling. As a matter of fact, Jesus said in Acts chapter one, before he ascended into heaven, he said, the reason why you have the Holy Ghost is not just so you can speak in tongues. The Charismatics think that we receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost just so we can soak on the, on the rug, you know, in the church, get slain in the spirit, get prophetic words, uh, or speak in tongues. And, and that's why, you know, in the Charismatic Church, you know, we say, uh, okay, we're going to pray for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And the whole idea is so you can speak in tongues. And we almost give the impression, the whole point of the baptism is so you can speak in tongues. When Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he said, you will receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Not so you can speak in tongues. That comes with it. 
he said, so you could be my witnesses. Someone say, so I could be his witness. As an image bearer, redeemed by God, you are called now to represent him as part of his heavenly council on the earth. And he didn't say you will be my witnesses in a building on Sunday for two hours. He said you will be my witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That is to say you are to bring the gospel to whole cities and regions and nations. By implication, it means the gospel is to go in the workplace, not just the church place. It is to go in the halls of power. It's to go in the slums. It's to go in the places of, of, of concourse. It tells us in Proverbs 8 that God's wisdom lifts up his voice to the cities. It is not just in the synagogue or in the temple. And when we only focus on the Sunday ministry, it would be like as if God told Adam, I want you to stay in the garden. I don't want you to do anything else but stay in the garden in a safe place and just walk with me. But no, he told Adam, I want you to bear fruit, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, and have dominion over what? The whole created order. He was never called to stay in the garden. And Jesus is called the last Adam in 1 Corinthians 15, 45, which means that he came to fulfill that which the first Adam failed to fulfill. He came to influence the whole earth. And so when he told us the spirit will come on us so that we will be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, it is going back to Genesis 1, 28, uh, the command of the first Adam to fill the whole earth. Do you see that? In Ephesians 4.10, it says that Jesus ascended to fill all things. Then it said in verse 11, and he gave some to be apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists to perfect the saints that are working in the ministry. So what is the work in the ministry? Verse 10, to fill the earth. That means the church gathered on Sunday is to be the church scattered on Monday. We're to take the gospel everywhere, meaning... Whatever you are gifted to do, whatever you're assigned to do from Monday to Friday or Saturday, you are as much a minister of God as responsible to carry the gospel by your life, by your preaching, as the pastor is on Sunday. Which means in the kingdom, it's not just the pastor who's important. Everybody is released into the work of the ministry because it takes everyone to fill all things. And the pastor, whether you're an apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, or evangelist, they're just called to perfect you, to equip you, which means the Sunday gathering is equipping center. The church is an equipping center more to send you out. It's, God doesn't really get impressed with how many people from your community come into your building. He's more impressed with how many you train and send out to fill cities with his word. Are you hearing what I'm saying? The, Church of the Kingdom is the church that loves their city, doesn't take their city, but what reaches their city. You don't take a city. Jesus didn't tell Adam to have dominion over people. He told Adam to have dominion over the fish of the sea, birds of the air, and over every creeping thing. That was before the earth was populated. But once the earth was populated with people, he changed the language, and he told Abraham, for example, in you all the families of the earth will be what? Blessed. Yes. And he talks about discipling nations, preaching the gospel, being a witness. And so the language was changed. So we don't use the word dominion now over cities or over people. If God called Adam to have dominion when the earth was populated with people, then you could justify slavery. Mm. That's having dominion over people. So I'm, I'm very cautious. I don't ever say we're called to have dominion. I don't say we're called to take cities. We're called to take neighborhoods. No, 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 no. That's Old Testament top-down language. Jesus modeled what the first Adam was supposed to do. Instead of the word dominion, Jesus modeled how we reach our community when he wrapped a towel around his waist and he washed the feet of his disciples. And he said, if I, your Lord and Master, can wash feet, so you ought to wash feet, meaning you should be a servant. He said, in the kingdom, it's inverted. The greatest isn't the top leader. The greatest is the servant. 
And so how churches reach this city is not by taking them, but by loving them, by serving them. And if your church meets the practical needs of your community, the politicians will beg you to lead them. Hallelujah. They are sick and tired of just having nice choirs, good preaching, and total irrelevance during the week. But the church that meets the needs of the people uh, is the church that will lead in the 21st century. Amen. That Amen. is what it's all about. And Jesus modeled that kind of leadership. And so when we think of the apex, the apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd, and teacher, we're thinking of a five-fold ministry group in the church that equips you in the workplace, not just the church place. We're also thinking of spiritual leaders who have the oversight over you. There are some who have that measure of the gift. Um, even though everyone has a piece of it, not everyone's called with the same measure. So some have that measure. Paul says that everyone will have a measure based on the gift of Christ, the measure of the gift of Christ, Ephesians 4, 7. So not everyone is going to be equal to the pastor in the church. But in your area of assignment, you are the expert, not the pastor. So if you're called to be an architect, you should be the best architect the world has ever seen. Amen. Do it unto the Lord. Amen. Tap into the wisdom of God. Your pastor is not going to be able to give you expertise or advice on how to be an architect uh, unless they were an architect in the past. But they're called to equip you to represent Christ, understanding the biblical worldview, understanding how to apply the scripture, how to move in the gifts, how to love, how to forgive, how to stay centered in your life. Then you could be an architect who not only has gifts and abilities, but an architect who represents Christ and fills that architectural firm with the love of God and begins to make disciples. That's how it works. So whatever place you're assigned to work from Monday to Saturday, whether it's being a parent, um, working with your children, being a spouse, that is the area where you're to bring God into your life. So it's not just bringing people to church, it's bringing the church to the people. Amen. How many of you say that? Yeah. So I know we got off track a bit from these notes, but I very rarely use notes. I just speak off the top of my head prophetically. Um, but when we think of how Jesus built the greatest movement the world has ever seen, we see what he said in his initial framing of his ministry when he called the disciples. He said, follow me and I will make you to become. I will make you to become. That's the original Greek. I will not make you become. I will make you to become fishers of men. Right there frames everything Jesus did. Number one, he didn't say, follow me, and I'll give you a Bible study once a week on Wednesday. Follow me, and you can come to church once a week and hear a message. You cannot make disciples from the pulpit. They had to be with Jesus. Follow me. And so if you're serious about being a witness of Christ, you have to make disciples. That means you have to take somebody under your wing, at least one person under your wing, and be a part of their life. And they are part of your life. They walked with Jesus. And most of his sermons were not done in the synagogue. They were done while he was walking, while he was sitting on a mountain, while he was sitting at a boat, while he was doing life with his disciples. He taught them. He used life's moments as teaching experiences and used the contemporary culture. If he was with fishermen, he said, follow me, I'll make you a fisher of men. If he was with farmers, he said, a sower sowed the word. He used the language that related or connected his truth to the people he was with. And that's why the sinners loved him. If sinners don't love you, that means you are too high and mighty, you're too religious, and you're too judgmental. Right. 
sinners were attracted to Jesus, but they were repelled by the Pharisees and Sadducees. Too often the church today repels sinners instead of attracts them. I'm not saying we should compromise our message. Jesus never compromised his message. But the way he acted, his personification, was one of love and acceptance, irrespective of whether they followed his law, understood his covenant, or even knew who he was. And he was able to hang out with people like the woman at the well, as we see in John chapter 4. And Jews were not allowed to be alone with women, yet he was alone with them, with her. Jews were not allowed to speak to Samaritans. It's almost like today, you're not allowed to hang out with a homosexual, or you're not allowed to be with a divorced per person, or you're not allowed to talk to people with tattoos on their face. That's how some churches are. Jesus broke all the taboos. He loved people unconditionally, and he didn't pick a man, he picked a woman to evangelize the whole city of Samaria. Isn't that amazing? When women were not allowed to be priests, or women were not allowed to be Pharisees, he chose a woman to be the one who brought the gospel. He chose Mary Magdalene to be the first one to proclaim his resurrection. He didn't choose Peter, James, or John. He chose a woman. And that's why the Catholic Church is often referred to Mary Magdalene as the apostle of the apostles because she was the first one who had the privilege of seeing the resurrected Christ. Why did he appear to her first? I don't believe it's because she was a woman. It was because she stayed there weeping, longing for him, while the others took a quick look and checked out. She stayed there seeking her, the love of her life. And he doesn't care. He's no respecter of persons. He loves those who love him. And those who seek him will find him. And he longs to be with those who long for him. That's why he told the woman at the well, the father seeks, in the Greek that's a very strong word, seeks those who worship him in spirit and in truth. And so he's longing, it tells us in, uh, what is it, Second Chronicles, uh, that the eyes of the Lord go to and fro across the earth, seeking those whose heart is perfect towards him. The reason why he could forgive David and not so many other kings is not because David lived a pristine life. David murdered, he even committed adultery, and I'm not condoning that. God has condoned that, obviously. But the reason why he chose David was because David was a man after God's own heart. And the other kings uh, were bypassed because they were guilty of what? Idolatry. They were after other gods, which was even worse to God than what David did because as soon as he was confronted with the truth, he immediately repented, went after God in spite of the challenges. He was a man after God's own heart. And so the word of the Lord to you prophetically tonight is be a person after God. That's more important than titles, than principles, than systems, than patterns. Become lovers of God and be more concerned with uh, what God thinks of you than what man thinks of you. Walk in the fear of the Lord, not in the fear of man. Be on God's side, have his agenda, don't have your own agenda, which is why when he taught us the Lord's Prayer, the first thing he told us was, say, hallowed be your name. God's what God is attracted to, worshiping him. Most of us, when we pray, the first thing we ask for is our daily bread. No, you've got it inverted. First thing is, I don't care if you're losing your marriage. I don't care if you're dying of cancer. I don't care if you can't pay your rent. The first thing is long for God. Worship Him. It's an act of faith, uh, and you'll release more faith. You'll have more prayers answered. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, when you delight after Him, He will give you the desires of your heart anyway. He said, when you seek first my kingdom and my righteousness, all the other things that Gentiles seek after, I'll give you anyway. It would be like a father who has one of his kids who just wants to sit on his lap 
and just says, I love you, Daddy. I love you, Daddy. And just hugs on to Daddy. I will tell you that that child will receive more impromptu gifts from the father than the kids who are just always complaining about the father or only coming when they want money or only using the father for gifts. Uh, no. Love the blesser more than the blessing. Delight in the Lord and seek first his kingdom and hallowed be thy name should be the first thing you offer up before you get to uh, for, uh, you know, give us this day our daily bread. It's hallowed be thy name. It's Abba Father who is in heaven. That means God longs to like you, not just love you. That word father in the Greek is Abba, which is not a formal term for father, but it is the most informal term. If you're Spanish, it would be papi or be daddy. That means God just wants to put you on his lap. That means God likes you, not just loves you. And then he says to pray for his kingdom to come and his will to be done. Everything is first about his agenda. But most people, they're in it for their own agenda. They come to church so that they can be self-actualized. So that they can have uh, five steps to happiness. This is the most of the preaching today, the body of Christ. You just turn on the TV. It's four steps to your fulfillment. How you can how, fulfill your vision. How you can be blessed. Five steps to your miracle. Six steps to your destiny. <laughs> Everything is about the false trinity. I mean mine. And the gospel, if Paul and Jesus were to come back to today's church and listen to the average television teaching, uh, they wouldn't recognize the gospel. They wouldn't even recognize most of the churches. They would probably say this is not a church. Most of these churches don't even have the Lord's Supper. It's not Christocentric. It's egocentric. It's personality driven. Wow. It's driven by the great men of God instead of the great God of men. And what we have to do is invert the kingdom and not exalt uh, the top leaders, but exalt the servants. And understand that we're really like Christ, as it says in Philippians chapter 2, it says, Let this mind be in you that is in Christ Jesus. And then it describes him not as some incredible king, but it says uh, he did not think it was robbery to be equal with God, but he Amen. took upon himself the form of a servant. Yes. And he became obedient even unto the point of death. Then it says God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name. But yet it tells us in James that God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. But yet we see all these people walking around like divas. Walking around like they're the superstars. We've got more celebrities in the church than we have in the world. We have more politics in the church than we have in the White House. And yet we wonder why, even though we have so much gospel preaching, this country is going down. We wonder why the culture is going down. It's because the church is all about themselves. We're about a narcissistic tendencies about seek, seeking our own pleasures about coming to church because uh, I'm going to a church that is big so it has good branding and it makes me look cool when I tell people the church I go to and uh, it has nothing to do with because God wants me there has everything to do with it's the place to be it's the flavor of the month it's the church that has the most Instagram presence a friend of mine was trained by a very famous church planning movement, and he went through it after a period of time, and he graduated, and he said to me, Bishop, after going through that program, you don't even have to be saved to have a church of 400. They teach you all the techniques, how much money to spend on Instagram, Facebook, and there's nothing wrong with that. But everything was about techniques and strategy. It had nothing to do with fasting and prayer. That's why we don't have a church of disciples. We have a church uh, of, you know, basically we just have crowds. Jesus never told us to make new converts. He said make disciples. So when Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you to become, it's all about the process. It's not about the event. Someone say it's not about the event. I don't care how many big events you have. If you are not 
either making disciples or being discipled, all the events are not going to mature you. You have people running from conference to conference. They're in some churches. Do you know that there was a, a poll taken about three years ago by Lincoln Air Ministries, and they interviewed 3,000 evangelical Christians. We're not talking about Catholics. We're not talking about uh, uh, you know Anglicans. We're not talking about uh, Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox, although many of them are evangelical, to be fair. But we're talking about people who believe the Bible. And they interviewed 3,000. And 78% of them believe that Jesus is a created being. It's a revival of modern-day Jehovah Hope Witnesses, which is an old heresy called Arianism. It's not because the pastors are preaching Arianism. It's because they're only preaching self-help messages. 30 years ago, we went from preaching theology to therapy. And now we got all these people, they're making them feel happy, but they're being left to their own opinions based uh, uh, when it comes to the important doctrines of the church. So we don't have disciples, we're raising up heretics. Many, many of the people in the body of Christ don't know what the Apostles' Creed is. They don't know that Jesus is not created. He's the creator. They don't know some of the basics. 50% of them believe the Holy Spirit is a force. Another Jehovah Witness doctrine. A large percentage of them believe that all religions lead to God. Another large percentage of them thought the Holy Spirit, uh, I'm sorry, thought that eventually everyone's going to be saved. That's a revival of universalism that destroyed Harvard and Yale. And these are evangelical churches, the next generation of believers. Most of the young believers believe that same-sex marriage is okay. It's not because the pastors are preaching that. It's because the pastors are silent. They don't say anything. There's no standards. I'm not saying you should talk about same-sex marriage every week. That would be stupid. There's obviously winsome ways of doing it. And you want to have conversations privately with people dealing with sexuality. Once in a while, you have to say certain things, especially if the text brings it out. But you say it where you don't pinpoint one sin. You bring out all of us as sins. In Romans chapter 1, it talks about homosexuality. And it says, at the end of it, those who practice such things are worthy of death. And so people take that scripture, and as you see, homosexual should get the death penalty. Oh, really? Read the whole context. <laughs> Romans chapter 1, first it talks about idolatry. Then it talks about gossipers, and slanderers, and backbiters. And so if the homosexual should get the death penalty, then everybody in the church should get the death penalty. Yes. And the pastors and preachers, they have a convenient way of picking out and passing out the sins they don't like. <laughs> the bottom line is we're all sinners. Yes. And every sin that was ever committed in the earth, we are all capable with the potential. So as it was, were you born gay? Well, everyone has the potential to be gay. An adulterer. You could almost say, yeah, you're born gay. Or you're born an alcoholic. Or you're born a murderer. Why? Because once we sinned, when Adam sinned, we were all born in sin, which means there's a potential based on the environment or based on how people talk to you or based on how you responded to people. Every one of us have the potential. It's only through the blood of Jesus by being a, a, a new creation. The message shouldn't be condemnation of one people group. It should be, hey man, we're all in this together. We're all image bearers. I found Jesus. I still have my issues. But guess what? It's good news. Jesus didn't come to condemn the world, but to save the world. You can find Jesus too. And Jesus has sorted it all out with them. You don't have to get them to be a hundredfold Christian right away. I mean, I thank God I had wise Christians. When I first got saved, every other word, I was cussing. I was brought up in a really rough area. 
And uh, I didn't realize that. I was even, when I was praying, I was literally cussing the devil out. <laughs> My friends told me three years later, they never told me in the beginning, because they know it would have mortified me. Because I used to lead in prayer and all the prayer meetings. I couldn't wait to pray. My friends told me three years later, you know, Joe, when you were praying, you were cussing. I said, get out of here. Are you serious? He said, yeah, we'd all be smirking and laughing in the corner. But, but you know, guess what? God anointed him. God anointed cussing prayers. Why? Because he meets you where you're at. You can't change everybody. We have some people that are in same-sex relationships or heterosexual that are living together. They come to church. You don't just talk to them the first day. Let God deal with them. Let the Holy Ghost deal with them. It would be like saying to someone who's a gossiper, a cursor, or a slanderer, you know, uh, or, you know, whatever, any sin you can think of, all right, you got to get it all together. Like within the next day or two, you can't come back here. <laughs> My God. So I plead with the body of Christ. Let's not pinpoint one sin. Let's not compromise our standards. We preach the word. But we need to understand. Jesus said, follow me. I'll make you to become. Someone say to become. To become. And you're still in that process. Jesus was able to take a cussing, compulsive, impulsive fisherman who denied him three times and within 40 days made him the greatest apostle of the church wow. who preached the first message on the day of Pentecost. Amen. If he was like a lot of us in the church who were judgmental and Pharisaic, Peter would have hung himself along with Judas. <laughs> there are even factions in the church, in the early church, Donatists, who they wouldn't even allow someone in the church if they denied Christ. Well, I guess they didn't read the same Bible I read. If they come back to Christ, ask for forgiveness, who are you to say you're not forgiven? And so... Jesus says you will become something. And the fisher of men means that Jesus sees what we're going to be in the future. This book is all about this process. What does he see in you? He turned, he changed Peter's identity. First thing that God does is he begins to recalibrate our way we view ourselves. He told Peter, um, your name is no longer going to be Peter, it's now Cephas. Meaning I'm making you an immovable stone. That's in John 1.42. So I'm not saying everyone has to change their name, but what happens is once you walk in that process of discipleship, you start thinking differently of yourself. Did that ever happen to you? Your identity changes. And some of you, you know, you have nicknames that you have to stop using because the world gave you that nickname. Because hmm. that nickname depicts things you used to do that probably weren't glorifying God. So why in the world do you want to be identified by that? Uh, you have to stop thinking of yourself the same way. There's some, some people who dress a certain way. They dress the same way they dressed before they knew the Lord. They walk around with their... Pants hanging down, the underwear sticking out, their hat on backwards, walking like this, and they've been saved for 10 years. They still think of themselves in the hood when God wants you to grow up. I'm not saying if someone wears their hat backwards if they're not a Christian or if their underwear is sticking out. Of course not. I don't care if you have tattoos on your behind. I don't care if you have. <laughs> earrings in your nose or in your navel. The point is identity. What is your identity? Yeah. Now some people may need to dress a certain way to reach certain people because that's their calling. That's different. But the way we talk, the way we walk, the way we act. 
He speaks what we think of ourselves, mm. who we are in the eyes of God, what we think of ourselves. I remember when I first came to Christ, I was a professional guitar player. And I was on my way to making it really big in music. Some of the producers of some of the biggest rock bands visited my studio and they told me I'm going to be the greatest guitar player in the world within two years when I was 17. I almost played in Madison Square Garden when I was 17. I had hundreds of people following me everywhere I went before I was saved. Everywhere I played, hundreds of people would be there. When I came to Christ, I tried playing the guitar with the worship team, and I was grieved. I couldn't even hardly play. I couldn't even follow the team. It was horrible. I couldn't play. And it was no flow. And I literally had to put the guitar down for almost 10 years. And then after almost 10 years, God commanded me to start playing again. And I said, whoa, what do you want me to play? I already, that's dead. I don't want to resurrect this. He says, part of my image is in your ability to play. And if you don't play, some of your creativity and some of the image of God I gave you is not going to come out to the world. I said, all right. I picked up that guitar. I couldn't even strum. Before, you know, I made it into a college playing violin solos. I played flute solos, saxophone solos, guitar, reading guitar music was too boring. I passed all that. Played jazz. I was a studio guitar player. I played at all, almost every kind of music. I played Hendrix. I could go on YouTube and see if Bishop does Hendrix. We did something seven years ago. We did a spoof. Bishop does blues. I mean, we did a bunch of things uh, that we posted. But we... Uh, so I was doing all that stuff, but I looked at myself as Joe, the guitar player. All my old friends saw me. When they saw me, they saw a guitar. God had to strip me of all that. He had to deconstruct that so that I didn't identify myself with something that was not my assignment. That's something that was an idol. Something that gave me human value. Your human worth should not come from what you do. Your human worth should come from who you are and whose you are. From Jesus Christ alone. That's why Jesus didn't even minister, it tells us in uh, Luke 3 and Mark, uh, Matthew 3. Jesus didn't even try to minister until the Father said, You are my beloved Son, oh. in whom I am well pleased. The Father said to Jesus, wow. I am well pleased with you, before he healed, before he preached, before he cast out devils, and before he went to the cross. Hmm. Jesus didn't dare minister until he was an affirmed Son by his Father. That's good. That's why he was able to make it through the temptations of the wilderness. Wow. And the first thing Satan said to him was to undo the powerful word that he received from his father. In the wilderness, Satan said to him, if you are the son of God, when the father just said, you are my beloved son, Satan tries to undo the prophetic word. That's why when you get a powerful prophetic word, watch out, within a few minutes or moments, you're gonna have psychological warfare. Try to undo everything that was said to you. Satan said, if you are the son of God, then he tried to compound and reverse the word by saying, to prove you are the Son of God, turn these stones unto bread. Wow. Meaning, the Father affirmed him and said, I'm well pleased with you. Before he did anything, Satan is saying, if you really want to prove you're the Son of God, you need to earn God's love by what you do. He sounded religious, but he was wrong. He was demonic. We have a lot of unaffirmed sons and daughters. That's why they fall in the wilderness. That's why they can't handle the temptation 
That's why there's so much competition in the body of Christ. That's why there's so much jealousy. That's why this pastor wants to build a bigger church than this pastor. That why they're unaffirmed. And they're subconsciously trying to earn their earthly father's love because their father abandoned them, rejected them, or they never knew it. So there's a hole in their heart that was never dealt with by the Father. They never got healed. Their identity is not secure in Christ, even though they're born again. And because of that, they're in competition with everybody. They're trying to have the largest ministry. Or you trying to be better than the one who's in your ministry. Competition amongst people in the church. And it all comes from you're not secure in your relationship with God. You're trying to earn the Father's love. And so there was a process of deconstruction. Somebody say deconstruction. deconstruction. I used my abilities to construct a musical career. God gave me the gift, but I used it for my own glory. Until that was worked out, out of my life, God brought me through a process of pain and deconstruction until he could trust me. Then he commanded me to pick up the guitar again. Now, I was able to play at a high level again. I don't remember all the theory. I don't remember how to read music because I didn't need all that. But I could play by ear. But the point is, he restored my gift, uh, even though there's some parts of it that I don't need or have. But he restored it after my identity in Christ was secure. Mm -hmm. The last thing I'll say before we do Q&A, we did not go through these points, but I learned a long time ago, if I go by my notes and not by the Holy Ghost, mm -hmm. we're going to have a dry meeting. Mm -hmm. And I'll be putting people to sleep before it's bedtime. <laughs> so I learned to... to get a sense from God and to speak out. So a lot of this is just prophetic axioms. Um, and I don't see anyone except a few sleeping, so I guess we're doing okay. <laughs> and there were only a few kids on, on Instagram while I was talking. So, you know, we're not half bad tonight. All right, so, of course people will say, I was taking notes. Really? Let me see your Facebook. What time? <laughs> when I was speaking and what time you posted, what time you were messaging, what time you were tweeting, what time you're on it. Let's really look at what you were doing while the person was preaching. Okay? But anyway, it happens to all of us. Uh, half is my own church, so I'm just being real. But anyway. When you get a prophetic word, it's like when Jesus said to them, follow me. And I will make you to become fishers of men. Fishers of men just means I'm going to make you a person of influence. He was able to see into the future. When you get a sense from God, or whether it's a prophetic word, whatever it is, but you get a sense from God what you're called to be and do for him. From the time you get that word until the time you walk in it, there's going to be a mean, mean test. Mm. To become, your purpose is released through pain mm -hmm. that brings brokenness. God says, I dwell in a high and lofty place with those who are broken mm -hmm. and contrite in spirit and tremble at my word. The higher your calling, the more pain, the more tests, and the more spiritual warfare you will be, uh, you will go through. If you are not experiencing spiritual warfare or tests, either you're backslidden and you're not in the game, you're a prisoner of war, or maybe you don't have much of a calling. But I tend to think all of us do have a high call. And if you're really engaged in that calling, there's going to be a process. Peter didn't know what he was signing up for. James didn't know what he was signing up for. Believe me, when God saved me when I was uh, 19 at the uh, January 10, 1978, as a professional musician, I didn't know what I was signing up for. 
I just know I love Jesus. And it's that love of Jesus that has kept me for 41 years. Because if you love anybody, including your spouse, more than Jesus, you're not going to make it. If you love your ministry more than Jesus, then your ministry is your mistress and not your assignment. Come on. Anything you love more than Jesus is you are committing adultery against him. Truth. Mm. Mm. And so my final words would be, the test will be when you have, look, more people fail when they're successful than when they fail. Because when you're successful, you have more options. The more money you make, the more options you have. See, a lot of people, they start making a lot of money. Next thing you know, they're only in church once a month. Why? Well, they're in the Hamptons. They're here. They're there. But when I brought them to Christ when they were a drug addict, they were in church every week. And as soon as God cleaned them up, got them a wife, got a good job, they forget about God. That's what happened with Israel. The more prosperous you are, the more successful you are, the more God will test your heart to see who and what you love the most. So I think we're finished now. Amen. I had no idea I was going to be speaking about this tonight. That's um, and I don't even know how we're going to do Q&A because we didn't stick to the notes, but you could ask me any questions related to discipleship, to process, to pain. Uh, well, Pastor, are we supposed to do something else? Do we do Q&A now? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. okay. <laughs> wow. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Thank you very much. I believe God just uh, gave us what we needed tonight. He knows what we need. He knows the exact uh, message we need. And He just spoke it to our heart. And I, and I believe you were blessed tonight. How many of us were blessed? Wow. Glad you came here tonight. Yes. Uh, we just thank you. I want to thank you, Bishop, for just uh, releasing yourself. Uh, really, we don't care about it. We care about what the Holy Spirit is. So we're going to open it up. If you have a question, we have our ushers who are wonderful. Who will be there. If you have any question as far as uh, what is, you know, he's given us a lot. Like drinking from uh, uh, from the hose or you know, fire hose rather right, tonight. So, but if you, if you have anything you have, any question on what I can talk about, I will apply to you. Uh, I think it will it will be this will be a good time. Uh, maybe I'll start by with a question. Um, the discipleship, as far as how you talk about it, I mean. Is there a way in church to formalize that or you think it should happen more organically? Uh, uh, because you mentioned everyone should be a disciple, be, should be discipling someone and be discipled by someone. Uh, is there a way in church can facilitate that? Uh, especially in the culture that we have now, uh, whereby everyone in the church uh, is being discipled by another person in the church and they are also disciples. We see a model that works better for a church where you know discipleship is being practiced uh, in a much more natural, organic way. A lot of them we try to do with program, it just tend not to work. So maybe you can give us your thoughts on how discipleship can be done. Yeah, well, I think it has to be part of the culture of the church. And so what we did uh, we saw a community that was very at risk in Brooklyn, totally transformed without gentrification, without poor people being pushed out. Predominantly Puerto Rican and Dominican, gangs all over, abandoned buildings. Um, most of the people were on welfare. Every kid had a different last name, broken families. So we started ministering there in 1981. And I realized 
that they didn't need a preacher, they needed a father. And basically I started seeing healing take place when I just started speaking words of affirmation over them, hugging young men who'd never been hugged before, machismo men who were in gangs. I remember some gang members wanted to assassinate me because we were closing blocks Showing the cross and the switchblade and seeing almost whole blocks come to Christ. We've seen incredible revival all over Sunset Park. And they wanted to kill me. And then at the end of the message, they'd come up and get saved, weeping. Um, and one of those gang members became the top salesman for Pitney Bowes. But one of the pastors of the church had him live with him because the gangs are 24 7. We would have told him, uh, you know, Come next Sunday, he would have never made it. And so some of these young men, I, I must admit, I brought them into my house as the Lord led. We had small kids, so we had to be careful. It was really the Lord. But we started our church off with just me meeting with men every week, pouring into them. So we didn't start a church. We started a disciple-making movement. If you start a church, you may or may not have disciples, but if you start disciple-making movement, you will have a strong church. Mm. So our DNA right from the beginning was making disciples. So because that's how we modeled the church, and my wife had meetings with women, um, same kind of thing, then all the leaders knew that they were supposed to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And discipleship is caught more than taught. Now, yes, of course, you have let's say, Bible Institute in the church or uh, midweek meetings and or trainings. Of course you do that because there has to be some kind of formal teaching outside of Sunday to process people. So discipleship takes place through the community, not just through one-on-one. -on -one. So you have general teaching meetings that show the culture of the house, that show the theology of the house, that is part of the discipleship making movement. Sunday message is part of the disciple making movement, but it can't be everything. Jesus didn't say, uh, come to a Bible study and I'll make you a fisher of men. He said, follow me. So you see how he did it. He did preach a lot, but he also had them hang out with him. So you have to have a combination of the uh, organic one-on-one -on -one or small group things plus the group teachings. So when you look at the book of Acts, you see a fascinating chronological process that was laid out. For example, the book of Acts, chapter 2, after Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, it said that there were added 3,000 souls mm -hmm. Then it says the number of believers that were added was 3,000. I think it's Acts 2.47. Yes. In Acts chapter 4, we see the same language. In Acts chapter 5, it said the number of the believers was 5,000. Never says the number of the disciples. They were not disciples when they first came. So then what happened? Well, by the time you get to Acts chapter 6, starting with verse 7, they started using the word disciples. It said the number of the disciples multiplied after they set in the six prototypes for deacons or the seven. So it had to do with uh, the enlargement of the leadership base gave them more space to make more disciples. And so you see that there was some kind of process. The hint of that corporate process was in Acts chapter 2 verse 42 when it says about the church that you know the 3,000 it said they devoted themselves to the apostles doctrine to the breaking of bread to the fellowship and to prayer so you see those four elements they had an intentional process in the temple they learned the doctrine. They had they had food together, which also was communion. They had general fellowship, meaning they did life together, and then they had corporate prayer. So everybody was expected to go through that process. 
So by the time Acts chapter 6 came, they were now called disciples. You could see Paul looking for disciples in Acts chapter 19 when he went to the coastline of Ephesus. And he built a strong movement that changed the whole city. You could see Paul's methodology in Acts chapter 14, verses 22 to 33, where it, he went and planted a church, and then he established the believers, and he made disciples. And he spent a lot of time with the disciples. And then some of those disciples he appointed to be elders, because you have to make elders that will oversee the church, but you have your pool of elders has to come from a group of disciples. If you pick someone to be an elder in the church who's not a disciple, you have, you're have having a lot of problems. If you pick someone just because they have a lot of money, big problem. If you pick someone just because they can preach good, big problem. Just because they sing good, big problem. If they're a disciple, that's your pool because they have the DNA of the house, the theology of the house, they're committed to you, they're loyal. So there was a process that was shown in Acts 2.42 and then you see Throughout the book of Acts, the word disciples started to be used starting with chapter 6. So, um, yes, you have to have both a pattern established in the church. Uh, we have about 15, it was 30 at one point, who every week they get on Zoom video, they learn theology, they learn the way of Christ and his disciples. We have first principles classes in our church, we have small groups uh, for fellowship and disciple making. I have a monthly meeting with men, I never give that up, where I try to disciple them, and I told them right from the beginning, you don't want to be a leader, this is not for you. You just want to have a nice meeting, to feel happy, and sure enough, the group went down from almost 30 to about 15, but I'm, I, I'm in the business of making disciples, not making people happy. Matter of fact, God doesn't even care if you're happy. God cares if you're faithful. Amen. It's about faithfulness, not about happiness. The most miserable people in the world are those who are focused on being happy. Because if you're focused on being happy, you'll be narcissistic, self-focused, and nobody, including your wife or husband, can ever make you happy. So you'll be a thorn in their side if that's all you're after. And Paul brought out to Timothy the criteria for who he would spend time with. 2 Timothy 2.2 became the foundation of our church. Paul said to Timothy, the things that you heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, teach, and there's a threefold criteria. They had to be faithful, they had to have ability, and they had to be able to teach. They had to be able to re not teach or preach like a pastor necessarily, but communicate what they learned so that they can make disciples. And Paul said to Timothy, focus on those people. If you just have ability, but you're not faithful, mm. you're wasting your time pouring into them. Mm. I know a lot of people with great gifting, but they never do anything for God because they're not faithful. They they're not tithing, or they're not in church enough, or they, you know, whatever. You can be very faithful, but if you don't have ability, God loves you. But <laughs> the senior pastor shouldn't invest most of his time discipling you because he has to disciple the ones who have the capacity and the potential to influence others and make disciples. So the home groups and the life groups are for everybody, but I'm talking about discipleship. The fellowships for everyone, but I'm talking about discipleship. The Sunday meetings for everybody, but I'm talking about discipleship. The midweek services and general teachings for everyone, but I'm talking about discipleship. So I'm not saying God loves certain people more. I'm saying no. Jesus picked 12 from a group of disciples. He didn't pick everybody, so I'm sure there was some hard feelings. <laughs> so the senior pastor and the top leaders have to go by that threefold criteria, 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. Faithful, able, and have the ability to teach. Then he went on to describe the attitude they were to have. He said, a hard-working farmer should be the first to eat of the fruits. He said, if someone is a soldier, he should be involved in civilian affairs. And then he said, an athlete needs to compete according to the rules. So he said, the disciple 
if not in the beginning, eventually, they better have the attitude of a military man, a hardworking farmer, and an Olympian. Discipleship implies the word discipline. That means that you are disciplined. Too many charismatics say, oh, I feel led to go here. I feel led to go there. <laughs> you gotta be disciplined. I don't care if you feel led to be in church or not. Be in church, get your butt to church. <laughs> People who miss so many important meetings, and they say, well, Pastor, my spirit was with you. I said, I said well, next time, let your body be with you, too. Because if your body's in church, your spirit will follow. The Holy Spirit only fell on 120 who were in the building on the day of Pentecost. The 520 Jesus appeared to after he rose from the dead uh, didn't get the Holy Ghost and they missed out on a historic time because their body wasn't where it should have been. So discipleship is about discipline. It's about being like a hardworking farmer. It's being in the military. If you don't have the commitment of an 18-year-old heathen that enlisted in the Marines, you can't be his disciple. Jesus said, it'll just cost you everything. You don't forsake everything. You can't be my disciple. Mm -hmm. Jesus didn't even care about crowds. When a crowd was following him in Luke 14, he said, unless you hate your father, your mother, uh, your own life, you cannot be my disciple. He wasn't into a seeker-sensitive, attractional church model. He was into making disciples. Because when you make disciples, you will have a strong church. Now, obviously, he wasn't talking about emotionally hating your father, your mother, your wife, and your life. He was, the word hate in the Greek has to do with priorities. He has to be first. Everything else, not second, a distant second. It shouldn't even be close. Otherwise, you can't be his disciple. Man. You put it all on the line. Offer your whole body as a living sacrifice. Not just Sunday morning for two hours. Not just your tithe. All your money belongs to God. There's so much more we can say, but that's only a long answer to a short question. <laughs> so any other question? Any question? We have, uh, okay. There was, yeah, uh, okay. Praise the Lord. Um, that was a very wonderful answer. My question is about discipleship as well. Uh, I've been in ministries where they have they, they have other ministries where you go to learn discipleship. So is discipleship ministry specific, or is it is there a template that discipleship can go through? So when I go through that process, I can go to any ministry and say I'm a certified disciple. <laughs> <laughs> Every church is different. <laughs> Whatever the theology of the house, the way the Lord has instructed the pastor, there are systems that the Lord has given the pastor and the elders to go through. So obviously that's part of it. But also part of it is that personal relationship with a mentor. And part of how you are going to be a disciple is you make a disciple. If you don't have anyone under your wing, I don't care how many programs you went to, you're not a disciple. A disciple is a disciple maker. If you're not willing to make disciples, you shouldn't be in a discipleship process. So the question I would ask everybody, who are you discipling? If you can't answer that question, I don't care if you're the top elder in the church, you're not a disciple. I don't care if you're giving most of your money away, you're not a disciple. Jesus called us to make disciples. That was not an option, that was a command. He said, go into all the world and make disciples. So disciple-making movement is that the whole church is, is empowered somehow. Not Look, the pastor can preach this. He can have all the programs in the world. It's up to you to respond. He can preach it, give the opportunity, but maybe only 25% will respond. There's probably only a remnant in every church that responds. Same way there's only a remnant of all who call themselves Christian who are really confessing Christians. is probably only a strong remnant in every church, not that are saved, but that are really disciples. You could be, look, this may be controversial. I believe you could go to heaven and not be a disciple. This is by, not by works. 
by the blood of Jesus. Right? right? You're not saved by being a disciple. You're saved by Christ's work, his work alone. So the thief on the cross didn't do anything for God. Mm. You can't call him a disciple. He said, <laughs> he said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I mean, a lot of Christians are hoping they have a near death experience like that. They just have to repent. A lot of people, get, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'm going to give my life to Christ right when I've already had all my fun. Hmm. Well, God is not stupid. It says, when you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. And it says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Isaiah 55. Unless the Spirit draws you, you can't come to God. So if you mock God and say, I'll follow you when after I'm clubbing, after I have all my fun, and I'm an old man, and one day I'm going to come to Christ, the Spirit may be through with you by then. Wow. He says, my Spirit will not always strive with men. Genesis 6. you got to be careful. You don't mess with God. Yes. <laughs> so I'm gonna be the one calling. I'm gonna be the one calling. Let's have this. So earlier you made a statement that Christ did not start his ministry until he was affirmed by God. Um, so then my question is, how do you know when you've been affirmed um, in order for you to go ahead and start your ministry? Well. One thing that'll help you is reading books like this because it helps you become self-aware. Also, have honest conversations with other people because we have a lot of blind spots. Um, people who love you, where it's a safe place. So some of the symptoms of someone who's not a farm is someone who is jealous of others, or they have a spirit of rejection, they interpret everything as an attack. They're self-defense. They're, they're, they're very defensive. If someone tries to correct them, their heads go up. Um, you're, you look through life as a victim. You have a victim mentality. When you're affirmed, you have thick skin. You forgive very easily. You're not easily offended. Uh, you can work with people and love them unconditionally even when they reject you and hurt you. It's not meaning that you don't have emotions. You can still get hurt, but because you're deriving your value from Christ and not from men, you have a greater capacity to walk in agape love. And a lot of marriages fall apart because one of the spouses, maybe both, they're trying to keep their marriage propped up by happiness and romance. God didn't call you to get married so you could be happy. He called you to get married so you could be holy. Amen. Your marriage is not sustained by your feelings of love. It's sustained by your covenant. If you are not committed till death do us part, then your marriage will not last because your secretary will show you more understanding than your wife after six months of living with you, smelling your breath and dealing with your garbage. Your secretary who doesn't know that side of you is going to show you a lot more love. But when she marries you and you leave your wife, she'll dump you too. So the whole thing is, Marriage has to be based on covenant. Mm -hmm. Covenant is made by death. Mm -hmm. The only way, when someone said to me once, Christianity is hard, I said, it's not hard, it's impossible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In order to live for Christ, you have to die. Yeah. That's why it says, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ who lives in me. In the life which I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul said, I die daily. I thought I was a holy man of God until I got married. I was saved in two years. I stopped cussing. I wasn't beating people up anymore. I didn't lose my temper anymore. And then after I got married, I was breaking chairs and putting my fists through walls. So better the chair than my wife. 
because I was a street fighter before I got saved. And I tell you, I, getting married showed me you are self-centered, boy. There's still areas of your life that you haven't surrendered to God. You didn't know about it. So you never know how much you've grown until you are in relational conflict with others. That's why it is impossible for you to mature as a Christian outside of a church community. You can't grow just with Bible studies. You grow by dealing with the garbage of other people. That's why Jesus said in John 17, 23, he said that I pray, Father, that they might be made perfect in one. The word perfect is a Greek word teleos. It means maturity. What did he say? You can't mature unless you work at being one with the body. It's not just one with the son. It's one with his body. So that's another long answer to a short question. <laughs> Thank you, Bishop, for that powerful teaching. Sure. Uh, my question was regarding, you said something to the fact of your purpose is released in pain or through brokenness. And you also said the higher the calling, the more. Can you just expound a little bit on that? Sure. <clears throat> I live in the biblical narrative, so I go by scripture and then I interpret my life experience through what I see in scripture. So you see, for example, Joseph. Joseph was betrayed by his brothers, he, uh, falsely accused by part of his wife, was in prison, and the baker and the other guy forgot about that he gave a dream. He had to stay in prison another three years. But after a certain point, it says in Psalm 105, God tested him with his word. Then he was elevated. You see, you're not ready for your assignment until you've been proven. The worst thing that can happen is you get elevated before you're ready. And the other thing is you have to ask yourself the question, am I seeking God commensurate to my assignment? If you very rarely pray, open up the Bible, and seek God, then you must not think you have much of a calling. Because your calling will also be released by the amount of time you spend with God. So it's according to how you respond to life circumstances, responding in faith. Joseph kept his integrity, had a spirit of excellence, whether he was with Potiphar, in prison, wherever he was, everything prospered. So God doesn't uh, protect us from pain or betrayal or the processes of life. Jesus promised us in the world we're gonna have trouble, but he's with us in the trouble when we walk through the fire, we will not be burning. So as we're in the fire, he's with us, and that's where he tests us. You can see the same um, Daniel put the lion's den. You can see the same with Jacob. Until he walked with a limp, God didn't change his name. Um, it was, that was symbolic of brokenness. You can see, um, oh, man, there's so, so many biblical stories. What about Paul? Paul had a revelation that was so great of Jesus Christ that it tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 that he was actually caught up to the third heaven and learned things that was unlawful for him to repeat. He had more revelation than he put in the New Testament. He wrote the most of anybody in the New Testament, but yet there's a lot of things he could have wrote, but he didn't. But then... He said, what, what did he also say? He said that a thorn in the flesh was given to him, a messenger of Satan. And he begged the Lord three times to take it away. But the Lord said he had that messenger because of the depth of the revelation he had so he wouldn't be puffed up. And he said, my grace is sufficient for you. God never said, I'm going to take away the messenger of Satan. He said, my grace will be with you when you're buffeted by Satan. Now, that's not talking about not resisting the devil. He prayed for the sick. It's not talking about people think the thorn in the flesh was sickness because they don't read the Old Testament. Thorn in the flesh 
you look at Numbers, Deuteronomy, different places, other judges, the thorn in the flesh was outside persecution. He describes the thorn in the flesh as 2 Corinthians 11, verse 17 and 34, had to do with being betrayed by others, shipwrecks, there were riots everywhere he went. It had nothing to do with Paul getting a physical sickness. If you get sick, you have the right to pray and believe God. If Satan attacks your mind, you have the right to resist it. So it's not talking about that kind of messenger of Satan. It's talking about how Satan couldn't get to Paul, so he used other people and circumstances to get to him. So if he can't get to you, try to get to your spouse. can't get to your spouse, try to get to your children. You can't get to your children, you get to your best friend. You can't get to your best friend, you get to your co-workers. can't get to your co-workers, you get to your neighbors. can't get to your neighbors, you try to get to the head usher. I remember this guy once said to me, he said, Pastor Joe, he said, Pastor Joe, I want to resign from the usher's ministry. I said, why do you want to resign? He said, because I can't get along with the head usher. I said, that's why God wants you to remain in the usher's ministry. Learn how to get along. Humble yourself. Work it out. Because if you run every time you can't get along from someone, you're going to be an immature Christian, emotionally mature, not being able to love uh, unconditionally, and you're going to continue going from one relationship to the next and never get anywhere. So the more you called, the more, look, the height of a tree is determined by the depth of the roots. Life experience, not just Bible studies. It's doing the word, not just hearing it. Those skyscrapers have a very strong foundation. If you have a foundation that's one feet deep, and you try to build a skyscraper, it may look good, but it's going to fall and cause a catastrophe. So you may want to get elevated. You want, God, give me that marriage right away. Give me that position. I thank God that God didn't answer most of my prayers. If he answered most of my prayers, I would have been in big trouble. He knows better what to give you after we're ready. Amen. All right. Okay. We're going to go for one more. Are there any? Uh, I'll get All right. I'll give uh, no more. Thank you, Bishop Matera, for that powerful teaching. Uh, just real quickly, something you said at the beginning really caught my attention when you were breaking down the gifts and efficiency for 11, as talking about each of us having Jesus Christ DNA and how we're supposed to take that gift to the back, to the marketplace, to the workplace. So, like, why are we not seeing it today? Like, there is over, at least currently in America, over 60% of people claim to be Christians, and yet we see very so much of Jesus in the marketplace, what do you think are some of the challenges that Christians are facing in taking some of this gifts and mentioned in Ephesians 4.11 to the marketplace, and how do you think we can overcome some of these uh, challenges? Well, when you look at the book of Acts, the church started out being called the way. The way. Jesus said, I am the way. After Constantine got converted in 311 AD, the church went from a way to an institution. Clergy and laity got separated. And the art of discipleship was largely pushed outside of the church to monasteries and other things. So we have to go back to the way of Christ and his apostles. We need to read the Gospels and the Book of Acts and see how uh, the principles that were in place, that's why I have this book, uh, Apostolic Leadership, and we need to start to mimic what we see in Scripture. So if we don't do things that were, you know, the Bible is not just descriptive, it's prescriptive. If we don't do what we see in the Word, we're not going to have biblical results. Another thing is, most pastors don't understand the pest. They don't even, you know that most churches believe in twofold ministry. The body of Christ is built on pastors and teachers. As a matter of fact, the word pastor is only used twice in the New Testament, and only once as an office in Ephesians 4.11. The word apostle is used all the time. Disciple is used, not believer, most of the times. Or, um, you know, we, so 
the reason why we have these issues is because most pastors are ignorant of a pest. They've only been taught in seminary, Bible schools, whether it's a Pentecostal or non-Pentecostal, all the denominations have basically rejected a pest. And if they say they have it in function they have, they don't understand the ministry of apostle and pastor, uh, I mean prophet. We understand evangelists, we understand teachers and pastors, but that's about it. So part of it is ignorance. And like I said in the beginning, the biggest part of it is we're not making disciples. We're just planting churches, trying to get crowds. We're building the church on how to get the most people in on a Sunday morning in a building. That is not God's highest priority. If we start off by making disciples, we will have strong churches. If we start off by having crowds, we will have few, if any, disciples. So there's a lot of issues involved. It's not a simple answer. Amen. Can we put that hands together?